Welcome to the Disrupt the Truth podcast. Today's guest is Tom Ziegler. He is the CEO of the Zig Ziegler Corporation, founded by his father. And he's been with the organization for a while, since uh, 1987. He's worked in the warehouse, the sales, working his father's book table, and he's climbed uh, to leadership. And now he's the president and the CEO. Uh, Tom's written a book that I think is good for all of us. It's called 10 Leadership Virtues for Disruptive Times. And I've enjoyed uh, reading this, also listened to a portion of it in the audiobook. I'm in sales, as a lot of you know, I'm in medical sales. And so I listened to it in the car. I had a, I was in the car for about five hours yesterday. And this is a great book. Tom, what inspired you to write this book about 10 leadership virtues for disruptive times? Yeah. So uh, the story goes back a few years. I, I came out with my first book, Solo, which was Choose to Win, came out in 2019. And when we did that book with Thomas Nelson, they wanted to do a two book deal. And so I thought that was a great idea. Uh, but then I said, but I don't know what the second book's going to be. And they <laughs> said, don't worry, you got a few years. So uh, in 2000 and um, towards the end of 2019, I was writing uh, a book and then the pandemic hit. Mm. And of course that changed everything. And so starting in about April of 2020, I've really been on a, a two plus year journey of studying everything that's changed in business and really in life uh, because of the pandemic, you know, all the trends, the, the way people make decisions, the way leader and, and the book is specifically about how do we lead during a time of disruption and what is it that people are looking for now that's different? How are they uh, making decisions now that's different than it was a couple of years ago. And so that's how the book came about. You talk about some of those trends in the first couple of chapters of this book, and you talk about COVID, you talk about people working remotely. And uh, what are some of those biggest trends that you have personally seen uh, during the last couple of years with the changes in the economy, with political challenges, with COVID? What are some of the major changes that you have observed and how does that affect you all at, uh, at your corporation as well? Yeah. So a couple of, of obvious ones that kind of happened right out of the gate. I remember when we had our first lockdown, uh, I read a, a statistic that people were spending 60 million fewer hours a day in their cars. Wow. And 33% of that got put back into productivity. And so one of the unexpected things that happened is for people who can do their job from home, productivity actually went up. Uh, you know, not everybody can do their job from home, but a, a lot of people can. In fact, here's a stat for you. <clears throat> There's about 125 million jobs in the United States. 60 million of them can be worked from home. Uh, you know, this could be anything that's technology or computer related that takes the phone or a Zoom meeting, something like that. And people started liking that. Um, that you know, I was talking to a friend last year and there was a guy who he's friends with and he was in an industry selling uh, testing equipment for Siemens and he'd had his best year ever made more money than he's ever made. Wow. And then he followed up and he, but he hadn't been on a sales call in two years. Yes. And so how is that possible when he used to travel internationally a couple of times a month uh, and he was, he was traveling at least once a week, but What's the difference? Well, he can do three meetings in a day when he used to do two meetings in a week. Yes. Now he gets to choose his meals and cook them himself. He spends half his time in his beach house, the other half at home. Right? Yeah. So his family relationships are better. And so does it make sense that the brain works better if you're eating right, sleeping in your own bed, uh, getting exercise, building family relationships? And so you're fresh all the time. Of course yeah. it does. So that was that was a big change. The other thing that happened is that people all of a sudden wanted their life to matter. In other words, they looked at their career and what they were doing and they saw friends and family getting sick and some of them passing away. And they realized, wait a second, there's no guarantee of tomorrow is what I'm doing what I really want to do. And so people really started making decisions 
based on the purpose or the why or the thing that made their heart sing in their life. I think you're you're spot on there. I mean, with all the things that are going on and there are negative aspects, but I think one of the very positives is that why factor, that purpose factor that so many people long for. And, you know, sometimes the millennials get a bad rap, but they're extremely creative in a lot of ways, like you said, very efficient from working from home and able to get things done. One of the, in one of your first chapters, you make a distinction between being just a manager and being a coach leader, someone who inspires. Can you tell us a little bit about that distinction and why in today's climate it's yeah. so important for us to be coach leaders? Yeah, so there's two terms that I use. Um, I talk about the traditional top-down do it because I said so, uh, command and control leader, mm -hmm. our manager, I actually call them a T-Rex manager. All right. And, and if you haven't noticed, T-Rexes are extinct, right? Yeah. And so when right. you think of that, that, that title, that means that, you know, they've got short arms, which means they like everything close to their chest. They like to control everything and they've got sharp teeth. So they lead with fear. Uh, and they bark out orders. And, you know, if you've got overall, if you've got decent people skills, even though you might be a little too much in the dictator style, if you're working in an office and people know that you care about them and you love them and, and you really want what's best, your, your team will see your body language and your intent and they will adjust for you. They will make uh, accommodation for you, but you take that same leader or that manager, that T-Rex manager, and you put them on a camera <laughs> and you start telling somebody on your team who lives a thousand miles away, you better get this done or else. And you, you text them at five in the morning and you email them at nine at night and you take away their quality of life through your style. Then all of a sudden you get this other thing that happened, which is um, there are, I think I read 1.8 jobs for every person looking for a job. Yes. So top performers, they're in the, they're, they control everything right now. If you're a top performer, you can work for anyone from anywhere in the world. You know, the, the progressive companies who want to win, who understand, hey, if we're going to grow and be effective in what we do, we got to bring in, we got to recruit, develop, and keep top performers. They they're going to pay your person top dollar to come, and yes. they're going to cater to that. A coach leader on the other side of this, they are what I call an accountability leader, and so what they do is they take the vision and virtues of the company or the organization, and they cast a vision. Hey, this is this is our company. This is our team. This is what we do. Here's the problem we solve. And then they get to know each person on their team individually and they ask them these type of questions. Hey, why are you here? Uh, if you have a great year, what does it look like at the end of the year? Do you want to make more money? Do you want to be promoted? What's your bigger purpose for being here? And then as that team member starts to share what it is that they're, you know, why they're there and what they hope to accomplish, the coach leader says, fantastic, let's co-create a plan where we can pay you more money. Let's co-create a plan where you can get a promotion. And then when that team member takes ownership of that, we call that team member a top performer. That's when the magic happens. Yes. Because the coach leader just comes back and says, Hey, can I hold you accountable to your goals? And that's what we mean by an accountability leader. Yes. And that's a great point. I think one of the stories that stood out to me as you were referencing this, you mentioned, I think it was Doc Rivers, one of the NBA, great NBA coaches, when dealing with personalities that are top performers, NBA, and I think it can apply to sales as well, that ability to ask the right questions to inspire and then to have accountability really stood out to me. One of the things that you referenced uh, in your book is a concept that you guys have taught for a while, and it was it's called the Ziegler Wheel of Life. Can you tell us a little bit about those seven spokes and why it's so important that as we are managing our lives in these really disrupted times, why it's so important for us to have those seven spokes uh, in line with excellence? Yeah. So, you know, let me just preface this by saying if you are a leader and you want to be a coach leader or 
you're a top performer and you want to keep performing at the highest level, then you're going to want to listen to these three attributes. And then I'll talk about the wheel of life. Uh, a survey just came out by Job Sage. I think they interviewed a couple of thousand people and they asked them about their work history over the last two years. So here's what happened. 28% of people quit their job in the last two years because of mental health reasons. Wow. Think about it. One in four quit their job because of mental health. And then Job Sage asked some deeper questions and they said, well, what, what contributed to your, you know, your low mental health that would cause you to leave? 55% said burnout and stress. 38% said depression. 37% said lack of motivation. And so, Dave, you just talked about the wheel of life. So what is the antidote for somebody who's got who's highly stressed and they're burned out? The antidote is what we call quality of life. So mm -hmm. there's seven spokes on the wheel. These are, We've been teaching this for five decades. So when you look at everybody's individual life, there's seven areas. There's the mental, which is the mindset. There's the spiritual, which are the principles and values and the faith that somebody has. There's the physical, which is, you know, that combination of getting plenty of sleep and exercise and eating right. And then there's the family relationships, you know, how I'm doing at home and with those I love. And then there's the financial side, you know, do I have a budget? Do I have a security? And then there's the personal side, which is, you know, my, where do I get my energy from? It's self-care, it's personal goals that I want to achieve. How do I take care of myself when things are tough? And then the last area, the seventh area is the career. And so this is what a coach leader does. A coach leader knows that they have to guard the quality of life of their people. And so they have to be there as a resource to help them to make sure that each person on their team is thriving in their mental, their spiritual, their physical, their family, their financial, their personal, and their career. So this is how it all makes sense. If I've got a great mindset, I get excited about what I do, I see purpose in it. If spiritually the integrity and character and values and virtues that I live by, if it's enriching my life, if I've got peace of mind, physically, if I'm, if I'm getting plenty of sleep and exercising and eating right, my family relationships are strong. I've got money in the bank and I've got personal goals that I'm going after. If all those are strong, I'm not going to get burned out. Yes. I might leave where I'm working because of a toxic leadership environment but it's not because I'm burned out. It's because I know there's better opportunities somewhere else. Do you think the reason that people are getting, seem to be getting burned out so much more is because they're missing one of those spokes because some of those are missing in our lives? Why? I mean, what have you noticed in the change? You've been leading for a long time. What are you noticing in the last, you know, in, in the trends in the last decade or so? Why, why are those numbers so high? Yeah, there's a couple of things. Um, there is more noise than ever. There's more inputs, you know, whether it's social media, cable TV, the news channels. Uh, now we're having, you know, in, you know, endless Zoom meetings. Uh, we're getting all these inputs. And then the it's really blurry. You know, when does the day start and when does the day end? You know, it used to be the day started when I got in my car and I took that journey to work. And that might be 10 minutes. It might be 45 minutes. And then on the way home, by the time I got home, it ended, right? Well, now you wake up and you've got text and email. So Microsoft in their office, they actually uh, ask permission of users to track their usage of Microsoft Office uh, programs. And for the first time in history, they have seen a spike in usage at eight o'clock at night. Hmm. And so if you're struggling health wise, if your relationships are rocky, if you're feeling isolated where you are, if your organization has lost people and fewer people are doing more work, right? If there used to be 20 people carrying the load and now there's 15 and it's spread between the 15, these are all things that add up to stress and burnout. 
Um, and, and so it now, and it looks never ending, right? It's like, yeah. well, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? When is this going to end? And far too many people, they, and I learned this from the book, The Black Swan by Nassim Tlaib, is they, he studied who does well in a black swan event, like a pandemic, like a financial crisis, like a world war. And it's the ones who can let go of the way it was. Wow. And so if you're stuck, you're not sure what your future is, you're trying to make ends meet, and you're hoping it goes back to the way it was, that is a mental drain. But if you flip it and you say, you know what? Here's my why. Here's my purpose. This is what I want to accomplish. And by the way, uh, the 38% said that depression was the reason that, you know, that they quit. And Rabbi Daniel Lappin says this, he says, the opposite of depression is not happiness. The opposite of depression is purpose. Okay. I like that. So imagine this, um, you want to get energized for what you do, get a clear purpose of why you do what you do. What's your bigger why? Take care of your wheel of life, right? That'll get rid of stress and burnout. And then the third one was lack of motivation. People quit because they weren't motivated where they were. Coach leaders understand that they've got to help their people co-create goals and growth plans. Uh, there was a Grow Motley survey that they asked potential uh, new hires who were out seeking a job. What do you look for in a new, a new business? And the number two uh, answer was, a personal and professional development plan. <laughs> In wow. other words, they want to work for somebody that sees a future for them and is willing to invest in them to help them grow and be more capable tomorrow than they are today. I like that. And I think that's like even the company I work with and, and I work in pharma, they certainly have uh, those those things in place, opportunities for growth. And I think a lot of this, I think you mentioned the other one, one of them was healthcare. I mean, we want good benefits, but right alongside of that, you mentioned, um, you know, this development, this opportunity to have a purpose and growth. And this is just a great book. I uh, like that you talk about some of these virtues. Let's go through and talk through some. Can you talk to us a little bit about virtue number one, kindness and selflessness, uh, virtue number two? You bet. I, I call kindness uh, the killer app, right? I mean, it's like, just imagine if our leadership on the, on the political leadership side, if both sides got, got together and just decided to be kind to each other, mm -hmm. right? You can bring your opinions in, you can bring your beliefs in, but if you show up and you're just kind to the other person, how much headway could we make? Uh, one of the stories in the book that fits really several of the virtues. It, it, it talks about uh, Frank Stewart, who, who's one of our Ziegler uh, legacy speakers. He was talking about early in his career, he got a new job and he had to go through a week of boot camp training, right? Where they just, it's like pharma does this, right? You go in and, you know, the person who hired him and the emails and everybody said, hey, you know what? When you show up, you got to have on a sports coat, and you got to have a tie, right? Because we're going to learn this as a professional environment. So everybody shows up for the first day and everybody's a new hire and they're looking around, right? So there's the new hire group. And then there's the supervisors who are going to manage these new hires. And then there's the regional managers. And then there's the person in charge of training. And then there's the big guy. And they look over and there's a guy in the room who forgot or didn't get the memo and he wasn't wearing a tie and he didn't have a sports coat. And so everybody was wondering what's going to happen. And so before anybody could take uh, action, before the supervisor could send him home, before the, before uh, one of the managers of the training leader came up and said, Hey, we got a problem. The big guy comes over and he takes off his tie and he takes off his coat and he hands it to the new guy. And he says, put this on. And so Frank says that the people in that class 20 years ago, they get together and they talk about the class and none of them remembers anything about what they learned except for the general manager taking off his coat and tie and giving it to the new hire. Powerful. 
That's the impact of kindness. And that kind of follows up with selflessness. You know, as a coach leader, um, this virtue is all about putting your people in a position to win, to get the credit to. And so what does that mean? It means that sometimes uh, you, you sacrifice a little bit. You give them the bigger piece of the steak, which is a story that I tell when I was a boy figuring out life. Uh, dad and I were eating steak and, and we both finished our steak and, and, and there was one piece left and dad said, you want to split that steak? And I said, yeah. So he gave me the knife and fork to cut the steak. And that was our tradition. I would usually cut it and he would pick or vice versa. Well, as I was starting to cut it, I thought, you know what, I'm going to see what dad will do. And so instead of cutting it 50, 50, I cut it 70, 30. And I could see the look of terror on dad's face. He realized, wait a second, <laughs> do I go for the obviously bigger piece? What's he doing? So dad reaches in and he gets the little piece. And I look at dad and I say, no, dad, I want you to have the big piece. And that was the best piece of steak either, either one of us had ever had. Yes. And that's what coach leadership is about. You want everyone on your team to have the big piece. Yes. And if you make sure everybody on your team gets the big piece, you don't have to worry about where you're going. I love those stories that you share about your parents. And, uh, you know, because sometimes, I mean, your father, you know, was very innovative. He was, you know, just a leader, well respected around the world, a best selling author, and, uh, you know, the, be in his shoes. But I like some of the stories that you tell about your parents and uh, your, your mom as well, that you, you said that uh, when they would go to Luby's uh, restaurant, just the respect that they showed to ordinary people. And as a kid, you, you said you didn't quite appreciate it, but you started observing. Maybe reference that story a little bit uh, about how you observed your parents as they went into the restaurants. Yeah, I've got a new story on that too. Um, so when mom and dad would, we would go to Luby's and Luby's is a cafeteria in the South. It was big when I was growing up. There's fewer, there's not many locations left. And so, you go into the cafeteria, you get in the serving line and you've got probably eight people on the serving line who serve your plate as you go down. Well, mom would walk in and she would make a beeline for the cashier and she'd give the cashier a hug. She'd give the tea lady a hug. And we went there a couple of times a week. So we were regulars and we, and they knew everybody. She'd ask about their kids and what's going on. We'd get in line and mom would go first. I'd go second in the middle. And I'm like 13, 14, 15 years old at this time. And dad would go last and dad would give a motivational speech <laughs> to each of the servers. You know, he'd encourage them. He'd lift them up. He'd ask how their family was doing. And he would literally have to tell them, stop serving me so much food because he, he couldn't eat it all. He was gaining weight. And that was that respect. And so dad always had this um, ability to look for anyone, anywhere in a, in get to know them and just respect them regardless of what their job was or what their role was at the, at the event. And so he, he looked at everybody as people. Well, just a couple of days ago, uh, I got a phone call from a gentleman and he said, let me, let me tell you a Zig story. And probably over 20 years ago, he ran into some trouble. He made some bad decisions. He reached out to dad and they started corresponding and then he didn't tell dad this, but he drove from his home across country and he just shows up in church. So he's going to surprise mom and dad in church. And he says, I lost my nerve, but I decided to sit up a little bit higher so I could see everything. And I thought to myself, somebody like Zig Ziglar, he'd probably sit down in the very front. And the redhead, because he'd listened to all the tapes and read the books, he, he said, I, I bet I recognize the redhead. And so sure enough, he says to me, Tom, I, I saw him down there. And he said, the service starts. And then your dad, and they'd probably been married 50 years at this time. He said, your dad reached over to your mom and held hands with her the whole service. Wow. And he said, that's when I knew it was real. Hmm. He said, I didn't, I didn't. Uh, interrupt him that day, but he said, I went to your, your company uh, offices the next day. I was able to speak to your dad for a few minutes. I think he'd set it up with Lori and 
He said that gave me the courage to go home and be a man and do the right thing. And, you know, his story is he ended up serving some time in prison. Uh, but he's, he, that turned his life around. He decided he was going to own up to the bad choices that he made and he was going to do things differently. And then I get to hear, here I am 57. I get to hear a story about mom and dad showing love, showing kindness, showing respect for each other in church 22 years after it happens. Wow. That's uh that's an amazing encouraging story, especially with all the, what we hear about uh, leaders that we respect, some in corporate world, some ministry, some sports who have let us down, who have fallen. I mean, just to hear that example about your parents uh, from someone else who gave you a call and you didn't even know about this. And, and, um, and here you are just kind of re-experiencing uh, this moment of, of being genuine that your parents had of love and respect towards one another. Your father said a positive attitude won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything better than a negative attitude. Talk to us a little bit about positivity and why that is so important. Yeah. So here's the reality. Um, disruption is happening at a greater frequency and a greater intensity than it's ever happened before. We can look at technology, we can look at politics, we can look at the global stage, we can look at the workforce, and things are rapidly changing. And so there's two things that we can do. We can, we can say disruption is negative, or we can say the truth, which is all disruption does is it creates opportunity. Disrupt the truth. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it creates opportunity. And so now what does positivity have to do with it? Well, if you're leading your family, if you're leading your friends, if you're leading your kids, if you're leading people on your team at the office and they see, they're watching you to see how you respond or react to disruption. Mm -hmm. And if you can say, oh, you know, this is terrible. When is it going to go back to the way it was? I can't believe everything we built. We got to redo because a competitor moved in or that bad report came out or they're locking down us, you know, again. Or you could say, this is fantastic because we're a group of learners. Our competitive advantage, our strategic advantage is the more disruption there is, the better advantage we have on our competitors and the more customers, the more people with problems that there are that we can go and serve and take care of their needs. And so I love disruption. This is fantastic. You know, do I wish it was easier? Yeah, I wish it was easier. But you know what? If we're out there solving problems, then we're making a difference. And that's what we do here is we make a difference. And so people look at that. They look at the countenance. And so what does that mean? Well, dad's quote, a positive attitude will outperform a negative attitude every single time. It's true. Well, our thinking determines our performance and our performance determines the future that we create for ourselves. And so at halftime, when a team's down by 10 points, does the coach go in there sour faced? And I can't believe this. What a waste, you know, <laughs> we're going to lose. Or does he go in there with positive input? Hey, you know what? We've, we've prepared, we've practiced, we've done it before. We can do it again. Of course, he's going to take the second approach because that increases the likelihood of winning. And so here's the question. Most people, when they look in the mirror, they say, yeah, I'm smarter than average. Most people say that. Well, if you're smarter than average, why would you ever let a negative attitude control what you do and the way you think? Because it's not smart. We, we battle this. I think there might be some listeners who say, yes, I agree. I think it's true. We need to be positive. But you talk a little bit about never give up. And then you also say at the right time, sometimes you need to step back and try something else. And you quote that, uh, I think it's Albert Einstein who said um, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Maybe there's someone out there and they are struggling with their career or their dreams or what they maybe thought they were supposed to do, their purpose. I know for me, uh, I remember I met your father at Prestonwood Baptist Church. I was teaching at Prestonwood Christian Academy, wanting to write Christian books. And he was so kind to endorse one of those books that I wrote called Why Trust Jesus. 
but into my 30s, I realized, you know what? I've been trying to write Christian books. I need to do something else that will provide more income, more money, and also make a change and I can be positive. And so I went into medical cells. I'm helping cancer patients. It wasn't what I expected, but it took a little bit of a shift. What advice would you give to someone? How do you what, how do you balance that for someone to be persistent and never give up, but at the right time, you know when to step back and make a change in their life? How how does one navigate that? Yeah, and so first off is you've got to understand what your bigger purpose and your bigger why is. Um, you know, I, I had a pity party. I'll be honest with you. When the lockdown happened, I got five emails and texts in one day saying that my services as a speaker were no longer needed. <laughs> so I thought the world was against me. And I can remember the thoughts in my head. I'm like, God, I love speaking. I'm a speaker. And I love that, you know, I'm in the speaking business. How, how could this happen? And the voice in my head came back and it sounded a little bit like that. And it came back and it said, you're not in the speaking business. You're in the life-changing business. Very good. And so that's a bigger why. And in, in, in incidentally, from a scriptural perspective, there is no moral high ground on what you do. If, you know, you can, you can be a teacher, you can be pharmaceutical sales, you can be a CEO, you can be a server at Luby's. It's all the same from a moral perspective. The question is, how are you impacting and treating the people God puts in front of you? Like how, are, how are you making a difference in their life? So the first thing you do is you get real clarity on what your bigger purpose is. And then you take stock of, you know, what have you tried and what have you been working on that's being frustrating? It's not getting any fruit. And what's changed beyond, you know, what else has changed? Uh, you know, your, your change probably had something to do with more responsibility, you know, more mouths to feed. Yes. Right. 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 That's true. And, and so, so you say, well, how could I do that in a way that honors uh, the creator? And mm -hmm. so you look at different options. And a lot of times in this position, uh, I really recommend, <clears throat> excuse me, talking to a coach or somebody who's been down that path. Yes. Uh, right. So to, to get feedback, because we want to work inside and with our strengths and talents, the gifts that God's given us. And we want to work for a higher reason, a higher calling uh, than just the paycheck. And so when yeah. we get some outside input, then we can get some new ideas flowing as well. Tom, that's outstanding. I like how you also talk about that we can have a warrior spine, but an open heart. And I just think there are so many good principles, no matter what, whether someone's a teacher or a manager, an entrepreneur, sales leader, so many great principles. I highly recommend this book. 10 Leadership Virtues for Disruptive Times. Before it is by Ken Blanchard. Uh, Tom, thank you for uh, writing this book. What is the best way for uh, someone, maybe there's a sales VP who's listening to this and they would love to have your corporation uh, do some training. What is the best way for them to get in touch with you and also for people to buy your book? Yeah, so to get the book, you can go anywhere. But if you want it autographed, you can go to Ziegler.com. So very cool. Yeah. Uh, and if you're looking, you know, if you're in a business and you're thinking, gosh, I want uh, leadership training, we do that. Uh, the best way to, to find out more about that is just to reach out to me personally, Tom at Ziegler.com. That's my email. Uh, but we do all kinds of, of leadership development, sales training, personal development. You know, we, we, we look at that, uh, that idea that, if somebody has quality of life in, in their personal life, they're going to be more effective at whatever they do. Yes. And then if they're working for an organization that understands coach leadership and they make that part of the daily rhythm, then you get alignment. And that's alignment is where an individual is fired up because every day they're getting closer to their purpose. And in the process, they're helping their company reach their mission and their goals. Excellent. Uh, well, Tom, thank you. It's been fun. I look forward to uh, staying in touch. Also, your podcast. Yeah, your podcast. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, The Ziegler Show. Uh, you can find it at iTunes or Stitcher. 
we've been doing the podcast, I think almost 13 years. We were an early adopter. Uh, we've had like 53 or 54 million downloads now. Unbelievable. We're on show 994 or five, somewhere in that. They have an all, you know, they're, they're release uh, twice a week. Um, and that, that thing is just, uh, it's, it's a powerful program. We bring in industry experts like Simon Sinek and Seth Godin and Dave Ramsey. And so if you want to hear some Zig wisdom and you want to hear experts that have taken the foundation of what we teach and applied it in their own field, you're going to want to check it out. That sounds great. Well, Tom, honored to have you on this podcast. And uh, thank you again for uh, joining the show. Thank you so much.